Hello everyone, it's Kat. There's your promised Let's Read. Today we are going to be reading Mercedes Lackey's Magic's Pawn, book one of the Last Herald Moon Trilogy. This is the first book my dad started me on with Mercedes Lackey. I believe she is a wonderful, wonderful author and I will never stop reading her books, ever. I have read this book 15, 16 times within the space of not very long. Well, let's get started. Mercedes, this is Mercedes Lackey, Magic's Pawn, book one of the last Herald Mage trilogy. One. Your grandfather, said Vaniel's brawny 15-year-old cousin Radavel, was crazy. He has a point. Daniel thought, hoping they weren't about to take an uncontrolled dive down the last of the stairs. Radavel's remark had probably been prompted by the very back staircase, one that started at one end of the third floor servants' hall and emerged at the rear of a linen closet on the ground floor. The stair treads were so narrow and so slick that not even the servants used it. The manor keep of Lord Within Ashkervans of Forest Reach was a strange and patchworked structure. In Vaniel's great-great-grandfather's day, it had been a more conventional defensive keep. But by the time Vaniel's grandfather had held the lands, the border had been pushed far past Forest Reach, and the old reprobate had decided, when he'd reached the late middle age, that defense was going to be secondary to comfort. His comfort, primarily. Not that Vaniel entirely disagreed with grandfather. He would have been one of the first to vote to fill in the moat for fireplaces and in all the rooms. But the old man had got, gotten some pretty peculiar notions about what he wanted where, along with a tendency to change his mind in mid-alteration. There were good points, windows everywhere, and all of them glazed and shuttered. Skylights lighting all of the upper rooms and the staircases. Fireplaces in nearly every room. Heated, privies part and parcel of the bathhouse. Every inside wall lathed and plastered against cold and damp. The stables, mews, kennels, and chicken yard were banished to new outbuildings. But there were bad points. If you didn't know your way, you could really get lost. And there were an awful lot of places you couldn't get into unless you knew exactly how to get there. Some of those places were important, like the bathhouse and the privies. The old goat hadn't much considered the next generation of his alterations either. He'd cut up the nursery into servants' quarters, which he meant which meant that Lord Withens boys went into the bachelor's hall and the girls into the bower. They were cramped in, until Lord Withens boys went into the bachelor's hall and the girls to the bower, they were cramped two and three into a series of very tiny attic level rooms. He was your grandfather, too, Vaniel felt impelled to point out. The Ashkeron cousins had a tendency to act as if they had no common ancestors with Vaniel and his sibs whenever the subject of Grandfather Jocelyn and his alterations came up. Huh. Radavel considered for a moment, then shrugged. He was still crazy. He hefted his load of armor and patting a little higher on his, on his shoulder. Vaniel held his peace and trotted down the last couple stone stairs to hold the door open for his cousin. Radavel was doing him a favor. Even though Vaniel was certain that cousin Radavel shared everyone else's low opinion of him, <sighs> Radavel was far and away the best natured of the cousins, and the easiest to talk around. The bribe of Vaniel's new hawking gauntlet proved too much for him to resist. Still, it wouldn't do to get him too angry by arguing with him. He might decide he had better things to do than help Vaniel out. Gauntlet or no gauntlet. Oh gods, let this work. Vaniel thought as they emerged into the gloomy black hall. Did I practice enough with Lyssa? Is this going to have a chance against stand a standard attack? Or am I crazy for even trying? The hallway was as cold as the staircase had been and dark to boot. Redeville took the lead, feet slapping on the stone floor as he whistled contentedly and tunelessly. Vaniel tried not to wince at the mutilation of one of his favorite melodies and drifted silently in his wake, his thoughts as dark as the hallway. 
in three days, Lissa will be gone. And if I can't manage to get sent along, I'll, I'll be all alone without Lissa. If I can just prove that I need her kind of training, then maybe Father will let me go with her. That had been the half-formed notion that prompted him to work out the moves of a different style of fighting than he was supposed to be learning. Practicing them in secret with his older sister, Lissa. That was what had ultimately led to this little expedition. That, and the urgent need to show Lord Withen that his eldest son wasn't the coward the arms master claimed he was, and that he could succeed on martial ground of his own choosing. Daniel wondered why he was the only boy to realize that there were other styles of fighting than the arm, than arms master Jervis taught. He'd read all of them, and knew that they had just, he had, they had just be as valid. Else why send Lissa off to foster and study with Trevor Corey and his seven would-be sword ladies? The way Daniel had figured, there was no way short of a miracle that he would ever succeed at the brute hack and bash system Jervis used. And no way Lord Withen would ever believe another style was just as good while Jervis had his ear. Unless Vaniel could show him, then Father would have to believe his own eyes. And if I can't prove it to him, oh gods, I can't take much more of this. With Lissa gone to Brendan Keep, his last real ally in the household be would be gone. Two, his only friend, and the only person who cared for him. This was the final trial of the plot he'd worked out with Liss. Radevel would try to take him using Jervis's teachings, and Vaniel would try to hold his own, wearing nothing but the padded jerkin and helm, carrying the lightest of the target shields, and trusting to speed and agility to keep him out of trouble. Radevel kicked open the unlatched door to the practice ground, leaving Vaniel to get it closed before somebody yelled about the draft. The early spring sunlight was painful after the darkness of the hallway. Vaniel squinted as he hurried to catch up with his cousin. All right, Peacock, Radevel said, good-naturedly, dumping his gear at the edge of the practice ground and snagging his own gambeson from the pile. Get yourself ready, and we'll see if this nonsense of yours has any merit. It took Vanuel a lot less time than his cousin to shrug into his armor. He offered tentatively to help Radevel with his, with his, but the older boy just snorted. Botch mine the way you botch yours? No thanks, he said and went on methodically buckling and adjusting. Vaniel flushed and stood uncertainly at the edge of the sunken practice, practice ground, contemplating the thick, dead grass at his feet. I never botch anything except when Jervis is watching, he thought bleakly, shivering a little bit at the cold breeze cut through, as the cold breeze cut through the canvason. And then I can't do anything right. He could almost feel the windows of the keep wall behind him, like eyes staring at his back waiting for him to fail. Again. What's wrong with me, anyway? Why can't I ever please father? Why is everything I do wrong? He sighed and scuffed the ground with his toe and wished he could be out riding instead of trying something doomed to failure. He was the best rider in Forest Reach. He and Star had no equals on the, on the most breakneck of hunts, and he could, if he chose, master anything else in the stables. And just because I won't bother with those iron-mouthed brutes father prefers, he won't even grant me an accolade there. Gods, this time I have to win. Wake up, dreamer, Radavel rumbled, his voice muffled in the helm. You want to have at least, you want to have at it. Let's go get it. Daniel walked to the center of the practice field with nervous deliberation, waiting until the last minute to get his helm on. He hated the thing. He hated the feeling of being closed in, and most of all, he hated having his vision narrowed to a little slit. He waited for Radevel to come up to him, feeling the sweat already starting under his arms and down the line of his back. Radevel swung, but instead of meeting a blow with a shield as Jervis would have done, Vaniel just moved out of the way out of the blow and on his way past Radevel to make a stab of his own. Jervis never cared much for point work, but Vaniel had discovered it could be really effective if you time things right. Radovel made a startled sound and got up his own shield, but only just in time, and left himself open to a cut. Vaniel felt his spirits rising as he saw the second opening in his many breaths, and, his ch and chanced another attack of his own. This one actually managed to connect, though it was too light to call a disabling hit. Light! Vaniel shouted, 
as he danced away, before his cousin had a chance to disqualify the blow. Almost enough, Peacock, Radovell replied, reluctant admiration in his voice. You land another like that with your weight behind it and I'll be out. Try this for size. He charged in his practice blade a blur beside his shield. Vaniels just stepped aside at the last moment while Radovell staggered halfway to the boundary under his own momentum. It was working! Radovell couldn't get near him, and Vaniel was pecking away at him whenever he got an opportunity. He wasn't hitting even close to killing strength, but that was mo mostly from lack of practice. If HOLD YOUR DAMN EYES! Long habit froze them both in position and the arms master of Forest Reach stalked onto the field, fire in his bloodshot glare. Jervis, the two of them, Jervis looked the two of them up and down while Vaniel swept sweated from more than exertion. The blonde, crag-faced, mercenary frowned, and Vandal's mouth went dry. Jervis looked angry, and when Jervis was angry, it was generally Vaniel who suffered. Well, the man croaked after long enough for Vaniel's, Vaniel's dread of him to build up to full force. Learning a new discipline, are we? And whose idea was this? Mine, sir, Vaniel whispered. Might you have guessed sneak and run would be more suited to you than an honest fight? The arms master sneered. Well, and how did you do, my bright young lord? He did all right, Jervis. To Vaniel's complete amazement, Radavel spoke up for him. I couldn't get a blow on him, and if he'd put his weight in behind it, he'd have laid me out a time or two. You're, so you're a real hero against a half-grown boy. I just bet you feel like another Veth Crethen, don't you? Jervis spat. Vaniel held his temper, counting to ten, and did not protest that Radavel was nearly double his size and certainly no half-grown boy. Jervis glared at him, waiting for a retort that never came. And strangely, that seemed to anger Jervis even more. All right, hero, he, snar he snarled, taking Radavel's blade away and jamming the boy's helm down over his own head. Let's see how good you really are. Jervis charged without any warning, and Va Vaniel had to scramble to get out of the way of the whirling blade. He realized that when then that Jervis was coming for him all out, as if Vaniel was wearing full armor, which he wasn't. He pivoted desperately as Jervis came at him again, ducked, wove, and spun, and saw an opening. This time, desperation gave him the strength he hadn't used against Radovel and he scored a chest stab that actually rocked Jervis back for a moment and followed it with a good solid blow to the head. He waited, heart and mouth, while the arms master staggered backward two or three steps, then shook his head to clear it. There was an awful silence. Then Jervis yanked off the helm and there was nothing but rage in his face. Radavel, get the boys and bring me Lordling Vaniel's arms and armor, the arms master said in a voice that was deadly calm. Van Radovel backed off the field, then turned and ran for the keep. Jervis paced slowly to within a few feet of Vaniel, and Vaniel nearly died of fear on the spot. So you like striking from behind, hmm? He said in that same deadly quiet voice. I think maybe I've been a bit lax in teaching you about honor, young my lord. A thin smile briefly sliced across his face. But I think we can remedy that quickly enough. Radovel approached with feet dragging, his arms loaded up with the rest of Vaniel's equipment. Arm up, Jervis ordered, and Vaniel did not dare to disobey. Exactly what Jervis had said, then, the uh, other than dressing Vaniel down in front of the whole lot of them, calling him a c coward and a cheat, an assassin who wouldn't stand still to face an opponent's blade with honor, Vaniel could never afterward remember. Only a haze of mingled fear and anger that made words meaningless. But then Jervis took Vaniel on. His way. His style. It was a hopeless fight from the beginning. Even if Vaniel had been good at this particular mode of combat, in moments Vaniel found himself flat on his back, trying to see around spots in front of his eyes, with his ears still ringing from a blow he hadn't even seen coming. Get up, Jervis said. Five more times Vaniel got up each time more slowly, each time he tried to yield. By the fourth time, he was wit-wandering, dazed and groveling, and Jervis refused to accept his surrender, even when he could barely gasp out words. 
Radevel had gotten a really bad feeling in his stomach from the moment he saw Jervis's face when Van scored on him. He'd never seen the old bastard that angry in all the time he'd been fostered here. But he'd figured that Vanuel was just going to get a bit of a thrashing. He'd never figured on being an unwilling witness to a deliberate massacre. That's all he could think it. Van was no match for Jervis, and Jervis was coming at him all out like he was a trained adult fighter. Even Radevel could see that. He heaved a sigh of relief when Vaniel was knocked flat on his back and mumbled out his surrender as soon as he could speak. The worst of the poor little snot had gotten a f was a few bruises. But when Jervis had refused to accept that surrender, when he beat at Van with the flat of his blade until the boy had to pick up sword and shield just to get the beating to stop, Radevel got that bad feeling again. And it got worse. Five times more, N Jervis knocked him flat each time with what looked like a an even more vicious strike. But the sixth time Vaniel was laid out, he couldn't get up. Jervis let fly with a blow that broke the wood and copper shield right in the middle. And to Radevel's horror, when he saw the boy fell back, that Vaniel's shield arm had been broken in half. The lower arm was bent in and the middle, in at the middle, and what can only mean both bones had snapped. It was a pure miracle that they hadn't gone through muscle and skin and Jervis's eyes were still not what Radevel would call sane. Radevel added up all the factors that came up with one answer. Get Lissa. She was adult rank. She was Van's protector, and no matter what the arms master said in justification for beating the crud out of Van, if Jervis laid one finger in anger on Lissa, he'd get thrown out of the keep with both his arms broken. If with if Withent didn't do it, there were others who liked Liss who lists a lot who would. Radevel backed off the field and took to his heels as soon as he was out of sight. Vanuel lay flat on his back again, breath knocked out of him, in a kind of shock in which he couldn't feel much of anything except, except that something was wrong. Somewhere. Then he tried to get up, and pain shooting along his left arm sent him screaming into darkness. When he came to, Lissa was beating, bending over him, her horsey face tight with worry. She was pale, and the nostrils of a prominent Ashkermon nose flared like a frightened filly's. Don't move, Van. Don't move, Van. No. Both the bones of your arm are broken. She was kneeling next to him, he realized, with one knee gently but firmly holding his left arm down so that he couldn't move it. Lady, get away from him. Jervis's voice dripped boredom and disgust. It's just his shield arm. Nothing important. We'll just strap it to a board and put some liniment on it and he'll be fine. She didn't move her knees, but swung around to face Jervis so fast that her braid came loose and whipped past Vaniel's nose like a lash. You have done quite enough for one day, Master Jervis, she snarled. I think you forget your place. Vaniel wa wished vacantly that he could see Jervis's face at that moment. It surely must be a sight. But his arm began to hurt. And that was more than enough to keep his attention. There wasn't usually a healer at Forest Reach, but Vaniel's aunt Serena was staying here with her sister during her pregnancy. She had had three miscarriages already and wasn't taking no and was taking no chances. She was she was attended to by her very own healer, and Lissa had seen to it that the healer, not Jervis, was the one that dealt with Vaniel's arm. Oh, Van. Lissa folded herself inelegantly on the edge of Vaniel's bed and sighed. How did you manage to get into this mess? That beaky Ashkervan nose and her determined chin combined with her anxiety to make her look like a stubborn, mulish mare. Most people were put off by her appearance, but Vaniel knew her well enough to read the heartsick worry in her eyes. After all, she'd all but raised him. Vaniel wasn't certain on how clear he'd be, but he tried to explain. Lissa tucked up her legs and rested her chin on her knees an unladylike pose that would evoke considerable distress from Lady Teresa. When he finished, she sighed again. I think you attract bad luck. That's all I can say. You can't do anything wrong. But you don't do anything wrong, but somehow things seem to happen to you. Vaniel licked his dry lips and blinked at her. Liz, Jervis was really angry this time. And what you told him didn't help. He's going to go right to father. 
if he isn't there already. She shook her head, and I shouldn't have said that, should I? Van, all I was thinking about was getting him away from you. I... I know, Liss, I'm not blaming you, but... But I made him mad. Well, I'll see if I can get to Father before Jervis does, but even if I do, he probably won't listen to me. I'm just a female, after all. I know. He closed his eyes as the room began to swing. Just try, Liss. Please. I will. She slipped off the bed, then bent over and kissed his forehead. Try and sleep. Like the healer told you, all right? He nodded. Tough-minded and independent like grandma like the grandmother who had raised her. Lissa was the only one of the only one of the keep willing to stand up to Lord Within now that Grandmother Ashkervan had passed on. Not surprising that given grandmother. For Ashkervan seemed to produce about one strong willed female in every generation. Much to the amusement of the Ashkervan males and the more compliant Ashkervan females. Lady Teresa anything but independent, had been far too busy with pregnancy and all the vapors she indulged in when pregnant to have anything to do with the resulting offspring. They went to the hands of the others until they were old enough to be usefully added to her entourage. Lissa went to Grandmother, but Vaniel went to Liss, and they loved each other from the moment she'd taken him out of the nursery. She'd stand him up to a raging lion for his sake. So Lissa went on went in to search for search of their father. Unfortunately, that left him alone. And unfortunately, Lissa didn't return when she couldn't immediately find Lord Within. And when she and that, of course, left him vulnerable when his father chose to descend on him like the god of thunders. Vaniel was dizzy with pain as well as with the medicine that the healer had made him drink when Lord Within stormed into his tiny white plastered room. He was lying flat on his back in his bed, trying not to move and still the room seemed to be reeling around him. The pain was making him nauseous, and all he wanted to do was be left alone in peace. The very last thing he wanted to see was his lord father. When Withan barely gave him enough time to register that his father was there before laying into him. "'What's all this about cheating?' Withan roared, making Vaniel wince in which he dared cover his ears. "'By God!' God, you whelp, I ought to break your other arm for you! I wasn't cheating, Vano protested, stung, his voice breaking at just the wrong moment. He tried to sit upright, which only made the room spin more. He fell back, supporting himself on his good elbow, grinding his teeth against the pain of his throbbing arm. I was, <laughs> he gasped through clen cl clenched teeth, I was just doing what Seldison said to do. And just who might this Seldison be? His father growled savagely, his dark brows knitting together. What matter of coward says to run around and strike behind a man's back, eh? Oh, gods. Now what have I done? Through his head, though his head was spinning, Vanel tried to remember if Harold Seldison's treaty on warfare and tactics had been one of the books he'd borrowed without leave. Or one of the ones he was supposed to be studying. Well... When Lord Within scowled, his dark hair and beard made him look positively demonic. The drug seemed to be giving him an aura of angry red light, too. Father, why can't you ever believe that I might be in the right? The book was on the approved list, Vandu remembered with relief as he re recalled his tutor, Ish Istal, assigning certain chapters to be memorized. It's... Harold Seldison, father, he said defiantly, finding strength in rebellion. It's from a book Istal assigned me about tactics. The words he remembered strengthened him still more, and he threw them into his father's face. He said, let every man that must go to battle fight with his talents, and not be forced to any one school. Let the agile man use his speed, let his armoring be light, and let him skirmish, but not close with the enemy. Let the heavy man stand shoulder to shoulder with his comrades in the shield wall. That the enemy may not break through, let the small man of good eye make good use of the bow. Aye, and let the herald fight with his mind and not his body. Let the herald mage combat with magic and not the sword. And let no man be called a coward for refusing the place for which he is not fit. And I didn't once hit anybody from behind. 
If Jervis says I did, well, I didn't. Lord Winton stared at his eldest son, his mouth slack with surprise. For one moment, Vaniel actually thought he'd gotten through to his father, who was more accustomed to hearing him quote poetry than military history. Parrot some damned book at me, will you? Lord Withen sn snarled, dashing Vaniel's hopes. And what does some damned lowborn herald know about fighting? You listen to me, boy. You are my heir, my firstborn, and you damned well better learn what Jervis has to teach you if you want to sit in my place when I'm gone. If he says you were cheating, then by damn you were cheating. But I wasn't cheating. And I don't want your place, Vano protested, the drugs destroying his self-control and making him say things he'd sooner have kept behind his teeth. That stopped Lord Within cold. His father stared at him as if he'd gone mad, grown a second head, or spoken in car sight. Great good gods, boy, he managed to sputter after several icy eternities, during which Vano waited for the roof to cave in. What do you want? I, Vaniel began, and stopped. If he told Withen that he wa that what he wanted was to be a bard, you ungrateful whelp, you will learn what I tell you to learn, and do what I order you to do. You are my heir, and you'll do your duty to me and to this holding if I have to see you half dead to get you to do it. And with that, he stormed out, leaving Vaniel limp with pain and anger and utter rejection. His eyes clamped tight against the tears he could feel behind them. Oh, gods, what does he expect of me? Why can't I ever please him? What do I have to do to convince him that I can't be what he wants me to be? Die? And now, now my hand, oh, gods, it hurts. How much damage do they do? Am I ever going to be able to play anything right again? Hey, Lavin. <laughs> he opened his eyes, startled by the sound of a voice. The door was cracked, o cracked part way open. Radovel peering around the edge of it, and Vaniel could hear scuffling and whispers behind him. You all right? No. Vaniel replied suspiciously. What the hell does he want? Radovel's bushy eyebrows jumped like a pair of excited caterpillars. Guess not. Bet it hurts. It hurts. Vaniel said, feeling a sick and sullen anger burning in the pit of his stomach. You watched it happen, and you didn't do anything to stop it, cousin. You didn't bother to defend me to father, either. None of you did. Radovel, instead of being put off, inched a little farther into the room. Hey, he said, brightening. You should have seen it. I mean, whack. And that whole shield just split, and you fell down in that arm. Will you go to hell? Vaniel snarled, just about ready to kill him. And can you take all those damn ghouls lurking out of here with you? Radovel jumped, looked shocked, and then looked faintly offended. Vaniel didn't care. All that mattered was that Radovel and whoever else was out there took themselves away. Finally left alone, Vaniel drifted into an uneasy slumber, filled with fragmented bits of unhappy dreams. When he woke again, his mother was surprised supervising the removal of his younger brother, Mikal, and all of Mikal's belongings from the room. Well, that was a change. Lady Teresa usually didn't interest herself in any of her offspring unless she had something to gain from it. On the other hand, Vaniel had been a part of her little court since the day he'd evidenced real talent for music about five years ago. She wouldn't want to see her own private minstrel. She wouldn't want to lose her own private minstrel which meant she'd best make certain he healed up all right. I wouldn't have you racketing about. She was whispering to me call with an unconcealed annoyance on her plump, pretty face. I wouldn't have you keeping him awake when he should be sleeping. And I wouldn't have you getting in the healer's way. Thirteen-year-old Mikal, a slightly shrunken copy of his father, shrugged indif indifferently. About time we went to Bachelor's Hall anyway, milady. He replied as Lady Teresa turned to keep an eye on him. Can't say as all miss the caterwauling and plunking. Although Vaniel could only see his mother's back, he couldn't miss the frown in her voice. It wouldn't hurt 
like you to acquire a bit of Vandal's polish, Mikhail. Lady Teresa replied. Mikhail shrugged again, quite cheerfully. Can't make silk out of wool, Lady Mother. He peered through the dancing candlelight at Vandal's side of the room. Seems my brother is awake. Hey la, Peacock. They're moving me down to the down court down to quarters. Seems you get up here to yourself. Out Teresa ordered, and Mikal took himself out with a heartless chuckle. Vaniel spent the next candle mark with Teresa fussing and weeping over him, indulging herself in the hysteronics she seemed to adore. In a way, it was hard to deal with Wiven's rage. He'd never been on the receiving end of, of her vapors before. Oh, gods. He kept thinking confusedly. Please make her go away anywhere. I don't care. He kept... He had to keep assuring her that he was going to be all right, and when he was not, and he was not at all certain of that himself. And Teresa's shrill, borderline hysteria set his nerves completely on edge. It was it was a decided relief when the healer arrived again, and gently chased her out to give him some peace. The next few weeks were nothing but a blur of pain and potions, a blur endured with one or the other of his mother's ladies constantly at his side and they all flustered at him until he was ready to scream, including his mother's maid, Melina, who should have known better. It was like being nursemaided by a covey of agitated doves. When they weren't worrying at him, they were preening at him. Especially Melina. Would you like me to get you a pillow? Melina cooed. No, Vayner replied, counting to ten. Twice. Can I get you something to drink? She edged a little closer, leaning forward, batting her eyelashes at you. No, he said, closing his eyes. Thank you. Shall I? No! Not sure which was worse at this moment, the pounding of his head or Milena's questions. At least the pounding didn't leave, didn't have to accompany by Milena's questions. Sniff. He cracked an eyelid open, just enough to see her. She sniffled again, and a fat tear rolled down one cheek. She was a rather pretty thing, the only one of his mother's ladies or maidservants who had managed to pick up Teresa's knack of crying without going red and blotchy. Vaniel knew that both McCall and Radivel had tried to get in had tried to get into her bed more than once. He also knew that he had that she had her heart set on him, and the thought of betting her left him completely cold. She sniffed a little harder. A week ago, he would have sighed and apologized to her, and allowed her, allowed her to do something for him. Anything. Just to keep her happy. That was a week ago. Now, it's just a game for her. A game she learned from Mother. I'm tired of playing it. I'm sick to death of all their games. He ignored her, shutting his eyes and praying for the potions to work. And they finally did, which at least gave him some rest from her company for a while. Van? That voice would bring him out of a sound sleep. Let alone the restless drug days he was in now. He struggled up out of the grip of fever dreams to force his eyes open. Lissa was sitting on the edge of his bed, dressed in riding leathers. Liss? He began, then realized what riding leathers meant. Oh, gods. Van, I'm sorry. I didn't want to leave you, but Father said it was now or never. She was crying, not prettily like Lady Teresa, but with blotched cheeks and bloodshot eyes. Van, please say you don't mind too much. It's all right, Liss, he managed, fighting the words out around the cold lump in his throat and the colder one in his gut. I... I know. You've got to do this. Gods, Liss, one of us has to get away. Van, I'll... I'll find some way to help you, I promise. I'm almost eighteen, I'm almost free. Father knows the guard is the only place for me. She hasn't had a he hasn't had a marriage offer for me in two years. He doesn't dare ruin my chances for a post, or he'll be stuck with me. Gods no, you're safe enough now. If anybody dare do anything before the healer says you're fit, he'd make a protest to Haven. Maybe by the time you get the splints off I'll be able to find a way to have you with me. She looked so hopeful that Vaniel didn't have the heart to say anything to contradict her. Do that, Liz. I'll, I'll be all right. She hugged him and kissed him and then left him. 
And then he turned to the wall and cried. Liz was the only support he had. The only person who loved him without reservations. And now... She was gone. After that, he stopped even pretending to care about anything. They didn't care enough about him to let Liz stay until he was well. So why should he care about anything or anyone? Or even be polite? Armor does more than protect. It conceals. Helms hide faces, and your opponent becomes a mystery. An enigma. Seldison had that right. Just like those two down there. The cruel blank stares of the helm slits gave no clues to the minds within. The two opponents drew their blades, flashed identical salutes, and retreated exactly twenty paces to each end of the opposite corners of the field. The sun was straight overhead, and their shadows little more than pools at their feet. Twelve rested, restive armor figures fidgeted on one side of the square. The harsh sunshine bleached the short dead grass to the color of light straw and let everything about the pair in pitiless detail. Hmm. Not such enigmas once they move. One fighter was tall, dangerously graceful, and obviously well-muscled beneath the protection of his worn padding and shabby armor. Every motion he made was precise, perilous, and professional. The other was a head shorter. Equipment was new, and the padding unfrayed. The metal lovingly burnished, but his movements were awkward, uncertain, perhaps fearful. Still, if he feared, he didn't lack for courage. Without waiting for his man to make a move, he shouted a tremendous defiant battle cry and charged across the sunburnt grass towards the tall fighter. As his boots thudded on the hard, dry ground, he brought his sword around in a low-line attack. The taller figure didn't even bother to move out of the way. He simply swung his scarred shield to the side, the sword crunched into the shield, then slid off. The metal screeching on metal. The tall fighter swept his shield back into guard position and answered the blow with a return that rang true on the shield of his opponent, then rebounded, while he turned the momentum of the rebound into a cut at the smaller fighter's head. The pale stone of the keep echoed the sound of the exchange, a racket like, like a madman loose in a smithy. The smaller fighter was driven back with every blow, giving ground steadily under the hammer-like onslaught, until he finally lost his footing and fell over backward, his sword flying out of his hand. There was a dull thud as he hit his head on the flinty, unforgiving ground. He lay flat on his back for a moment, probably seeing stars and scarcely moving, arms flung out on either side of him as if he meant to embrace the sun. Then he shook his head dazedly and tried to get up only to find the point of his opponent's sword at his throat. Yield, boy. Yield, rumbled a harsh voice from the shadowed mouth slit of the helmet. Yield, or I run you through. The smaller fighter pulled off his own helm to reveal that he was Vangel's cousin, Radivel. If you run me through, Jervis, who's going to polish your mail? The point of the sword did not waver. Oh, all right, the boy said with a rueful grin. I yield. The sword, a pot metal practice blade, went back into its plain leather sheath. Jervis pulled off his own battered helm with his shield hand, as easily as the weight and wood of, as the weight of wood and bronze wasn't there. He shook out his sweat dampened blonde hair and offered the boy his right, pulling him to his feet with the same studied, precise movements as he'd used when fighting. Next time you yield immediately, boy. Arms Master rumbled, frowning. If your opponent's in a hurry, he'll take banter for refusal, and you'll be a cold corpse. Jervis did not even wait to hear Radevel's abashed scent. You! On the end! Mika! He waved to Vaniel's brother at the side of the practice field. Helm up! Vaniel snorted as Jervis jammed on his own helm, back on his own head, and stuck back to his former position, dead center of the practice ground. The rest of you laggards, he growled. Let's see some life there, pair up and have at. Chervis doesn't have pupils. He has living targets, thought Vaniel as he watched from the window. There isn't anyone except Father who could even give him a workout. Yet he goes straight for the throat every damn time. He gets nastier every day. About all he does is give them what he only... He does give them is that he only hits half force which is still enough to set Radov on his rump. Bullying bastard. 
Banner leaned back on his dusty cushions and forced his aching hand to run through the fingering exercise yet again. Half of the loot strings plunked dully instead of ringing. Both strength and agility had been lost in that hand. I am never going to get this right again. How can I? When half the time I can't feel what I'm doing. He bit his lip and looked down again, looking at the sunlight winking off McCall's head, helm four stories below. Every one of them will be moaning and plastering horse liniment on bruises tonight, and boasting in the last breath about how long he lasted against sure was this time. Thank you, no, not I. One broken arm was enough. I prefer to see my sixteenth birthday with the rest of my bones intact. This tiny tower room where Vanuel always hid himself when summoned to weapons practice was another legacy of Grandfather Jocelyn's crazy building spree. It was Vanuel's favorite hiding place, and thus far, the most secure. The storage room just off the li a storage room just off the library. The only conventional access was through a tiny half height door at the back of the library, but the room had a window. A window on the same side of the keep as the window of Vanuel's own attic level room. Any time he wanted, Van could climb easily out of his bedroom, edge along the slanting roof, and climb into that narrow window. Even in the worst of weather or the blackest night, the hard part was doing it unseen. An odd wedge-shaped nook. This room was all that was left of the last landing of the staircase to the top floor. An obvious change in design, since the rest of the staircase had been turned into a chimney and the hole where the roof trap door had been now led to a chimney pot. But that meant that although there was no fireplace in the storeroom itself, the room stayed comfortably warm in the worst weather because of the chimney wall. Not once in all the time Vanuel had taken to hiding here had anything new been added to the clutter of or anything been sought for. Like many other of the old lord's eccentricities, its inaccessibility made it easy to ignore. Which was fine, so far as Vanuel was concerned. He had his instruments up here two of which he wasn't even supposed to own, the harp and the gittern. And any time he liked, he could slip into the library, purloin a book, and at the point of the room, he had an old chair to sprawl in, a collection of candle ends, and a chest beside it so that he could read when the light was bad. His instruments were all safe from the rough hands and pl pranks of his brothers. He could practice without anything disturbing him. He had arranged a set of old cushions by the window so that he could watch his brothers and cousins getting trounced over all over the old moat where he played. While he played, or tried to play. It afforded a ghost of amusement sometimes. The gods knew he had little enough to smile about. It was lonely. Daniel, but Daniel was always lonely. Since Lissa had gone... It was bloody awkward to get to, but he couldn't hide in his room. Though he hadn't found out until he'd healed up, the rest of his siblings and cousins had gone down to the bachelor's hall with McCall while he'd been recovering from that broken arm. He hadn't, even when the healer had taken the splints off. His brothers slandered his loot playing when they'd gone, telling his father that they were just as happy for Vaniel to have his own room if he wanted to stay up there. Probably with him, recalling how near the hall was to his own quarters, had felt the same. Vanil didn't care. It meant that the room was his and his alone. One scant bit of comfort. His other place to refuge, his mother's solar, was no longer the retreat it had been. It was too easy for him to be found there, and there were other disadvantages lately. His mother's ladies and fosterlings had taken to flirting with him. He enjoyed that, too, up to a point. But they kept him waiting to take it beyond the range of the game of courtly love to the romantic, for which he still wasn't ready. And Lady Teresa kept encouraging them at it. Jervis drove me call back step by step. Fools, Vanil thought scornfully, forcing his own fingers through the exercise in time with Jervis's blows. They must be mad to let that sour old man make idiots out of them day after day. Maybe break their skulls, just like he broke my arm. Anger tightened his mouth, and the memory of the shuddered satisfaction he'd seen in Jervis's eyes the first time Vanil had encountered him after the accident rolled in his stomach. Damn that bastard, 
he meant to break my arm. I know he did. He's good enough to judge any blow he deals within a hair. To at least he had a secure hiding place. Secure because getting into it took nerve, and neither Jervis nor his father nor any of the rest of them would ever have put him a, put him and and a climb across the roof together in the same thought. Even if they remembered the room existed, an ill-assorted lot below didn't look to be relatives. The Ashkerman cousins had all gone meaty when they hit adolescence, big boned, muscled like plow horses, and about as dense. But Wyvern's sons were growing straight up as well as putting on bulk. Vandal was the only one of that lot taking after his mother. Wyvern seemed to hold that to be his fault, too. Vandal snorted as McCall took a blow to the helm that sent him reeling backward. That one should shake up his brains. Serves him right, too, carrying on about what a great warrior he's gonna be. Clawed-headed beanpole. All he can think about is hacking people to bits for the sake of honor. Glorious war. Ha! Fool can't see beyond the end of his nose. For all that pranding, if he ever saw a battlefield, he'd wet himself. Not that Vaniel had ever seen a real battlefield, but he was the possessor of a far more vivid imagination than anyone else in the family. He had no trouble in visualizing what those practice blades would be doing if they were real. And he had no difficulty at all in imagining the deadly wounds of the ballads being inflicted on his body. Vaniel paid close attention to all his lessons, if not to weapons work. He knew all of the history ballads, and unlike the rest of his peers, he knew the parts about what happened after the great battles as well. The lists of the dead, the dying, the maimed. It hadn't escaped his notice that when you added up those lists, the tolls were a lot higher than the number of heroes who survived. Vaniel knew damned well which was the list he'd be on. Ever came to an armed conflict. He learned his lesson only too well. Why even try? Except that every time he turned around, Lord Within was delivering another lecture on his duty to the hold. Gods, I'm just as much a brute beast of burden as any donkey in the stables. Duty. That's bloody all I ever hear, he thought, staring out the window, but no longer seeing what lay beyond the grass. Why me? Mikal would be a thousand times better a lord holder than me, and he'd just love it. Why couldn't I have gone with Lissa? He sighed and put the loot aside, reaching inside his tunic for the scrap of parchment that Trevor Corey's page had delivered to him after he'd given Lissa's official letters into Teresa's hands. He broke the seal on it and smoothed out the pal palimpsest carefully. Clever Lissa to have filched the scrap and stain piece that no one would notice was gone. She'd used a good strong ink, though, even though the letters were a bit, bit blurred. He had no trouble reading them. Dearest Vaniel, if only you were here. I can't tell you how much I miss you. The Cory girls are quite sweet, but not terribly bright. A lot like the cousins, really. I know I should have written you before this, but I didn't have much of a chance. Your arm should be better by now, if only Father wasn't so blind. What I'm learning is exactly what we were working out together. Vandal took a deep breath against the surge of anger at Within's unreasonable attitude. But we both know how he is, so don't argue with him, love. Just do what you're told. It won't be forever. Really, it won't. Just hold on. I'll do what I can from this end. Lord Cory is a lot more reasonable than Father ever was, and maybe I can get him talked into asking for you. Maybe that will work. Just be really, really good. And maybe Father will be happy enough to, with you to do that. Loveless. He folded the letter and tucked it away. Oh, Liss, not a chance. Father would never let me go there. Not after the way I've been avoiding my practices. It won't be forever, hmm? I suppose that's right. I probably won't live past the next time Jervis manages to catch up with me. Gods, why is it that nobody ever asks me what I want? Or when they do ask, why can't they mean it and listen to me? He blinked and looked again at the little figures below, still pounding away at each other, like so many tent pegs determined to drive each other into the ground. He turned restlessly away from the window and stood up and replaced the loot in the makeshift stand he'd contrived for it beside his other two instruments. 
and everywhere I turn I get the same advice from Liss. Don't fight, do what father asks from mother. Crying vapors and essentially the same thing. She's not exactly stupid. If she really cared about me, she could manage father somehow. But she doesn't care. Not when backing me against father was likely to cost her something. When I, And when I tried to tell father Laren about what Jervis was really like, he shuddered. The lecture about filial duty was bad enough. <sighs> but the one about proper masculine behavior. You would have thought I'd been caught fornicating sheep! And all because I objected to having my bones broken. It's like I'm doing something wrong somewhere, but no one will tell me what it is and why it's wrong. I thought maybe Father Laren would understand since he's a priest, but gods, there's no help coming from that direction. For a moment, he felt trapped up here. The secure retreat turned prison. He didn't dare go out, or he'd be caught and forced in that dis armor, and Jervis would lay into him with a vengeful glee to make up for all the practices he'd managed to avoid. He looked wistfully beyond the practice field to the wooden land and meadows beyond. It was such a beautiful day. Summer was just beginning, and the breeze blowing in his open window was heady with the aroma of the hayfields in the sun. He longed to be out walking or riding beneath those trees. He was as trapped by the, other th by the things he didn't dare do as by the ones he had to. Tomorrow, I'll have to go riding out with Father on his rounds. He gloomed, and no getting out of that. He'll have me as soon as I come down for breakfast. That was a new torment, added since he'd recovered. It was nearly as bad as being under Jervis's thumb. He shuddered, thinking of all those farmers staring, staring, like they were trying to stare into his soul. This was not going to be a pleasure jaunt for all that he loved to ride. No, he would spend the entire day listening to his father lecture him on the duties of the Lord Holder to the tenants who farmed for him, and the peasant farmers who held their lands under his protection and governance. But that was not the worst aspect of the ordeal. It was the people themselves, the way they measured him with their eyes, opaque eyes full of murky thoughts that he could not read, eyes that expected everything of him, that demanded things of him that he did not want to give and didn't know how to give, even if he wanted to. I didn't want them looking into me like that. I don't want to be responsible for their lives, he shuddered again. I wouldn't know what to do in a drought or an invasion, or, and what's more, I don't care. Gods, they make my skin crawl. All those people eating me alive with their eyes. He turned away from the window and knelt beside his instruments, stretched out his hand and touched the smooth wood and taut strings. Oh, gods, if I weren't me, I could just have a chance to be a bard. In the days before his arm had been hurt, he had often imagined himself a court bard. Not in some out-of-the-way corner like Forest Reach, but one of the great courts. Gyre Falcon's Marches, or Southron Keep, or even the High Court of Valdemar at Haven. Imagine him himself, the center of a circle of, admir of admirers, languid ladies and jewel-bedecked lords, all of them hanging enraptured on every word of his song. He could let his imagination transport him to a different life, the life of his dreams. He could actually see himself surrounded, not by girls of Teresa's bower, but the entire high court of Valdemar, from Queen Elspeth down until the visual visualization was more real than his true surroundings. He could see, hear, feel all of them waiting on impatient anticipation for him to sing. Bright candles perfume the pregnant silence. <sighs> now that was even lost to him. Now practices were solitary, for there was no Lissa to listen to new tunes. Lissa had been a wonderful audience. She had had a good ear and knew enough about music to be trusted to tell him the truth. She had been the only person in the keep besides Teresa who didn't seem to think there was something faintly shameful about his obsession with music, and that she was the only one who knew of his dream of becoming a bard. There were no performances before his mother's ladies, either, because she, he refused to let them hear him fumble, and all because of the lying, bullying bastard his father had made arms master. 
Whiffin! He froze, startled completely out of his brooding by the sound of his mother's breathless, sh slightly shrill voice just beyond the tiny door to the library. He knelt slowly and carefully, avoiding the slightest noise. The last thing he wanted was to have his safe hiding place discovered. Whiffin! What is it you've dragged me up here to tell me that you couldn't have said in my solar? She asked. Vino could tell by the edge in her voice that she was ruffled and not at all pleased. Vanu held his breath and heard the sound of the library door being closed, then his father's heavy footsteps crossing the library floor. A long, ponderous silence. Then, I'm sending Vanu away, Within said brusquely. What? Teresa shrilled. You? How? Where? Why? In God's names, Within, why? Vanuel felt as if someone had turned his heart into stone and his body into clay. I can't do anything with the boy, Teresa, and neither can Jervis. Within growled, I'm sending him to someone who can make something of him. You don't, you can't do anything because the two of you seem to think to make something of him. You have to force him to be something he can never be. His, her voice, Teresa's voice was muffled by the intervening wall, but the note of hysteria was plain all the same. You put him out there with a man twice his weight and expect him to to behave like a man. He's a sniveller, a whiner, Teresa. He's more worried about damage to his pretty face and delicate little hands than damage to his honor. And you don't help matters by making him pet of the bower. Teresa, the boy's becoming nothing more than a popinjay, a vain little peacock. And worse than that, he's a total coward. A coward! God's with it! Only you would say that! Lady Teresa's voice was thick with scorn. Just because he's too clever to let that precious arms master of yours beat him insensible once a day. So what does he do instead? Run off and hide because he got... Because once, just once, he got his poor little arm broken. Great good gods, I'd broken every bone in my body at least once by the time I was his, his age. Is that supposed to signify virtue? Or stupidity? Vanyl's mouth sagged open. She's, my God, she's standing up to him. I don't believe this. It signifies the willingness to endure a little discomfort in order to learn. Withen replied angrily, thanks to you and your fosterlings, all Vanyl's ever learned was how to select a tunic that matches his eyes and how to warble a love song. He's too damned handsome for, for his own good, and you've spoiled him, Teresa. You've let him trade on that pretty face and get away with nonsense and arrogance you'd have never permitted him to call. And now he's no sense of responsibility whatsoever. He avoids even a hint of obligation. You'd prefer him to be like Mikal, I suppose. She replied acidly. You'd like him to hang on your every word and never question you, never challenge you. Damned right! Within war roared in frustration. The boy doesn't know his damned place, filling his head with book-learned nonsense. He doesn't know his place? Because he can think for himself? Just because he can read and write more than his bare name? Unlike certain grown men I could name, God's within! That priest of yours has you parroting every little nuance, doesn't he? And you're sending Van away because he doesn't measure up to his standards of propriety, aren't you? Because Vanyl has the intelligence to question what he's told, and Laren doesn't like questions. Her voice reached new heights of shrillness. That priest has you so neatly tied around his ankle that you wouldn't breathe unless he declared breathing orthodox enough. Ah, Vanyl thought, the part of his mind still working, while the rest of sat stunned and silent in contemplation of the idea of being sent away. Now Teresa's support had a rational explanation. Lady Teresa did not care for Father Laren. Vanyal was just a convenient reason to try and drive a wedge between Withen and his crony. Although Vanyal could have told her that this was exactly the wrong way to go about doing so. I expected you to say something like that, Withen rumbled. You have no choice, Teresa. The boy is going, whether you like it or not. I'm sending him to Seville at the High Court. She'll brook no nonsense, and once he's surrounded where he's not the only pretty face in the place, he might learn to do something besides lisp a ballad and moon, him, moon in himself in the mirror. Seville? That old Harridan! 
His mother's voice rose with each word until she was shrieking. Daniel wanted to shriek, too. He remembered his first and last encounter with his Aunt Seville only too well. Daniel had bowed low to the silver-haired stranger, a woman clad in impeccable heraldic whites, contriving his best imitation of courtly manner. Harold Seville, who had packed herself up at the age of fourteen and hied herself off to Haven without a word to anyone, and then been chosen at the moment she passed through the city gates, was Lissa's idol. Lissa had pestered Grandmother Ashkavan for every tale about Seville the old woman knew. Daniel couldn't understand why, but if Lissa admired this woman so much, surely there must be more to her than appearance on the surface. It was a pity that Lissa was visiting cousins the only week her idol chose to make an appearance at the familial holding. But then again, maybe that was exactly as Wethin had planned. So this Vaniel, the woman had said dryly, a pretty boy, Teresa. I trust he's something more than ornamental. Vaniel went rigid at her words, then rose from his bow and fixed her with what he hoped was a cool, appraising stare. God, she looked like his father in the right light. Like Lissa. She had that Ashkervon nose, a nose that both she and Wythin thrust forward like a sharp blade to cleave all before them. Oh, don't glare at me, child, the woman said with amusement. I've had better men than you try to freeze me with a look and fail. He flushed. She turned away from him as if he was of no interest, turning back to Vaniel's mother, who was clutching a handkerchief at her throat. So, Teresa, has the boy shown any sign of gift or talent? He sings beautifully, Teresa flustered. Really, he's as good as any minstrel we've heard. The woman turned and stared at him, stared through him. Potential, but nothing active, Seville said slowly. A pity. I'd hope you, at least one of your offspring would share my gifts. You can certainly afford to spare one of to the Queen's service. But the girls don't even have potential gifts, and the four other boys are worse than this one. And this one doesn't appear to be much more than a clothes horse for all his potential. She waved a dismissing hand at him, and Daniel's face had burned. I've seen what I've came to see, Teresa. Leading Vaniel's mother off by the elbow, I won't stress your hospitality any more. From all Vaniel had heard, Seville was in many ways not terribly unlike her brother, hard, cold, and unforgiving, preoccupied with what she perceived as her duty. She had never wedded, and Vaniel was hardly surprised. He wouldn't imagine anyone wanting to bed Seville's chill arrogance. He couldn't imagine why warm, loving Lissa wanted to be like her. Now his mother was weeping hysterically, his father was making no effort to calm her. By that, Vaniel knew there was no escaping the disastrous plan. Incoherent hysterics were his mother's court of last resort. If they were failing, there was no hope for him. Give it up, Teresa, Wethin said, unmoved, his voice rock steady. The boy goes tomorrow. You unfeeling monster! That was all that was understandable through wi Teresa's weeping. Vaniel heard the staccato beat of her slippers on the floor as she ran out of the library door. Then the slower, heavier sound of his father's boots. Then the sound of the door closing, as leaden and final as the door on a tomb. So, that was the first chapter. I will finish reading to you the rest of the chapters of this book. Um, warning, this video will be long. I'm sorry that it was so long, guys. Um, comment anything you want to... Comments, concerns? Be sure to like and subscribe. Bye!